department priorities, uh, but I want to indulge you in a, in a quick story first. Um, my brother, Mark, passed away last month. He's just 52. Um, and when he passed away, I was pretty angry because he showed up at the emergency room and he was in incredible pain. He couldn't breathe anymore. Within an hour of being admitted into the emergency room, his lungs collapsed and he went into a coma. And doctors said he would never come out of the coma. Uh, he eventually came out of the coma. In fact, when he came out of the coma, he ripped everything, including the ventilator, out of him. And the first thing he said was, Mike, because I was sitting there, get me the hell out of here, they're trying to kill me. That was my brother. And I was angry because when the doctors came in and told me he had bone cancer, it was terminal, there was no cure, and he had it in every bone in his body. And I couldn't understand how in this day and age, with the medical professionals that we have, the technology we have, the science we have, how they couldn't detect that because he had gone to the hospital and to the doctor over and over and over again. He kept telling me he had arthritis. I was angry. Thinking back on it, though, I'm not as angry now as I was then because Mark was a recovering addict. And Mark had a tough life. Started with alcohol and morphed into marijuana, cocaine, ended up with heroin. He put a lot of pressure on my parents, practically bankrupted them at one point. And we all hear that term, uh, you know, let's not enable an addict. It's hard when you're a family member not to do what you think you need to do to help your family member. And so my parents did what they could. Mark tried to get clean and sober about 23 years ago. Um, and he got clean many times, but he couldn't stay clean. And then about 14 years ago, my other brother, my older brother died. He was only 40 years old, also died of cancer. He's a 20-year Marine. My brother was duly diagnosed at that point with mental illness. And so he began being treated for both. That was the first time that Mark not only got clean, but was able to stay clean. Because they were treating both his mental illness and the substance abuse at the same time. And I remember talking to Mark through the years because Mark was a pretty vain guy growing up, athletic. A lot of fun to be around when we were young. But he was the type of guy who would go out in the summer. And this is before we have all this cheap dye on the street. He used to put lemon juice in his hair every summer, stay out in the sun, and would turn blonde. You know, he'd be all tanned up. And uh, he'd think he would movie star, you know. But when he went on some of the medication he had to be on, uh, to manage his mental illness, one of the side effects was he put on weight. And I remember talking to Mark about it and asking him, you know, if this is an issue of medication, maybe you want to talk to the doctors about uh, adjusting the medication. And he said to me, I am not gonna fool around with my medication. I don't care how fat I get. I'm not gonna risk using it again. That's how committed he was to the process. When Mark was younger, before he was able to stay clean, he flattened like a couple of times. And this is before Narcan and all that other stuff. He was just, when he did it, in a good place where they were able to bring him back. One time, my parents were there. He was blue, almost gone. Okay? And as a family, you went through a range of emotions. Anger. You were disappointed. You were extremely frustrated. Because you didn't know how to deal with it. But when Mark did get clean and sober, and was able to stay clean and sober, we got him back because Mark was always one of the greatest guys I knew. He would give you his shirt off his back. And so the anger went away because Mark, the person that we knew, returned. I remember when he passed away, we had his funeral. It was at a church. It was above where they have an AA meeting. My dad started that AA meeting 40 years ago in that same church. In fact, this is how ironic it was. The priest, the pastor in that church, took my aunt, who's been a nun for 60 years, to the prom. So imagine how that day went down. Right? But below, Mark had shared that AA meeting for 12 years. 
and he was, uh, his funeral mass was above. And then after the mass, uh, folks joined the AA meeting down below. Literally hundreds of people were at his funeral. And I like to say a lot of times that it's not your title in life, how much money you have, how big your house is. It's about the impact that you have on the people you touch along the way, because that's what people remember. And that's the legacy that you have. And what I was so proud of Mark was at that funeral, I, I had literally hundreds of people that approached me, some that I never met, that said, Mark helped to save their life. Because for the past 10 years, he's been working as a peer support to others. So he didn't have the type of wealth folks have, he didn't have all of the fancy toys in life. But he was working with people, helping them get clean and sober. And he used to have a saying, folks told me this, I didn't notice it on my brother, they called him the happy guy. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, his big talk to folks was that he chooses every morning when he gets up to be happy. He gave many of his years of his life to addiction. And because of that, it's caused him health issues. Obviously, it caused some financial and job issues. It caused disruption in his family relationships. Some of that he was able to mend and repair. But he said, I can't waste the rest of my life feeling sorry for myself. So I choose every day to be thankful that I am clean and sober and to be thankful for the life that I do have because he was able to redevelop a relationship with his wife and with his kids uh, in a very strong relationship. And so for me, as I thought about his death and as angry as I was at the medical system for not diagnosing it properly, I think now it probably happened the way it should happen. Because if they had diagnosed with my brother Mark three years earlier when they said this began, uh, this is the type of bone cancer that would have been uh, terminal anyway. They would have been able to extend his life, but it would have meant that he would have had to go on pain medication. And that would have destroyed everything about what Mark was about, because he was afraid to death of going back on pain medication. In fact, when I talked to the doctors in the hospital, they said they don't understand how he has never showed up at the hospital or gone on pain medication. They've never seen anything like it. And I'm convinced it's because he was so afraid of pain medication, but also his brain convinced him that this is just arthritis. His wife told me he would sit in the chair and couldn't get up, and he would have to talk to himself and say, you wimp, you wimp, push yourself up. That's how much pain he was in. But he did all his daily activities, never went to get pain medication, and died. Now, they had him on pain medication, but after he went into a coma, so uh, he never had it. When he came out of the coma, one of the last things he did is he gave me his medallion, 14-year medallion. In where Mark goes to meetings and stuff, uh, you were considered a long time in recovery if you hit that 15 year mark. And that was something uh, that he was looking forward to. He didn't make it. But I consider him a long time in recovery. Because anyone who lived through what he lived through in the last three years of his life, and didn't resort to self-medication and stayed on the road he was on. That's a long term. I carry his medallion in my pocket to remind me of his struggle against addiction, but also to remind me that this hope after recovery. So many folks in this state today are struggling with addiction. Some have lost their job, some have lost their home, their livelihood. Some have lost their lives. Too many have lost their lives. It doesn't have to happen. There are family members like me all around the state who have someone they love who's struggling with this and their families in disarray. It doesn't have to happen. There is hope after recovery and we have to get and make sure that more of these folks are able to access treatment because they can be productive folks in the lot. You know, I'm the secretary of the problem with children family, the secretary of a state agency, one of the biggest state agencies around the country. And my brother, who was not a high school graduate, who some would look at and say he's nobody, had more of an impact 
on people in his last 10 years than I could ever have. But people were saying, he saved my life. And his, the work he did is a peer to help others become clean and sober. That's who we're fighting for, okay? And so I can tell you as a department, the people within the department is, are as committed as we can be to making sure we have the necessary resources on the ground to continue this fight. Because everybody deserves a chance. Ox last 14 was the happiest in his adult life. They really were. Everybody should have a second chance and should have that same opportunity. And the only way they get there is through an effective uh, course of treatment. So I think as a state, we owe it to these folks to make sure we make an investment in their future. It has a multiplying effect because all of these folks have families, many have kids. So the money that you invest is a multiplying effect. Now I will tell you, as I get asked this a lot, it doesn't mean that we uh, don't have to make changes because this is not all about money. It's not just about increasing detox beds and getting people clean because if people get clean and can't stay clean, it doesn't matter. It's not about increasing residential services. It's not even about increasing medication assisted treatment, which we've done in this state through a $27 million grant. That $27 million was intended to be a supplement to what we were already doing. And even that is not going to help anybody become clean and sober unless it's linked effectively with services. Sending somebody to simply uh, replace the drug of choice uh, with a different drug without treatment is not what we want to be as a state. What worked for my brother was when all those components came together, where he was able to go to a place where he could get clean. He could get ongoing services. He had a very strong aftercare program. He was himself a peer support. Addiction is a lifelong issue. And so getting somebody clean and sober in the near term is fine. Without a strong peer support network in place, they can't maintain that over a lifetime or have difficulty doing so. And it's never a one size fits all. So our challenge as a system is yes, we need more money in our system. We need more resources on the ground to continue this fight. But we also have to make sure that our services are fully coordinated and integrated so that folks pass through our system of care in a way that makes sense to them. And when they get clean, they have an opportunity to stay clean. I know Senate Bill 12 was largely focused on that, on the whole coordination of care effort. That's why we've made a big effort within the department to do that. And we're going to continue to do it. Um, I would like to say, uh, as Senator Garcia did, for those folks in the room um, that are on the front line, that interact directly with folks like my brother every day, thank you. You really do save lives, you change lives, you restore families. And I know it can be frustrating work, uh, and I know that you're challenged right now um, in some areas with reductions in resources rather than uh, increases in resources. I understand that. But I encourage you to keep making that fight because there are millions of people.